Thank you very much. And thank you, everyone. It's, it's an honor to be here, and I wanted to thank Nicola and Carmel for pour m'inviter d'être ici. Merci beaucoup. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah so, so this is a, so I know I'm, a, I'm going to talk, I think I have an hour, including questions and answers, and I'm the person who's keeping you from coffee, so in an hour, and I know it's early in the morning still, so, so Nicola, I'm going to count on you to sort of cane me because I don't have a clock here, so I'm not watching the time. And, oh, perfect, oh, good, thank you. Um, and, and feel free to interrupt me within reason if you have questions. This is a little bit outside the domain of what I think this, this conference normally does, but I'm hoping that there are some things that, that, that you could get out of it, and I'll try to highlight those as I, I go along because this is sort of a different, a different um, topic. So formal languages help agents learn and reason. Uh, I wanted to start by acknowledging my graduate student, my former graduate student, Rodrigo Taro Acarta. A lot of what I'm talking about is, is some of the work that he did for his PhD in collaboration with, with some of our other colleagues who are uh, now elsewhere, but were at University of Toronto at the time. So Torin uh, Klassen and Rick Valenzano, and also Alberto Camacho. And of course, it takes a team. Oh, sorry. Let me just, yeah. Let's make sure that this is going to work um, to, to uh, to do all this work, so, so kudos to all of them. So I wanna just pause for a minute and talk about sequential decision making. And, and of course, sequential decision making is making a sequence of decisions over time. And of course, we see it everywhere, and I think it's, it's fundamental to security and to trustworthy AI to be studying sequential decision makings. So we see them in a recommender system is a, a, a sequen typically a se sequential decision making system. The, the controller that, that an autonomous car is a sequential decision making system. The controllers that control the, the traffic lights and the nuclear power plants, all of these things are sequential decision making systems. And I've spent a lot of time studying them. And, and um, just to sort of give you a sense of, of what's comprised in a sequential decision making, one, one might ask oneself, how and what does an agent need to know to decide how to act? And of course, it needs some notion of state. It needs some, uh, some, some model of the environment and environmental assumptions, environment behavior. Um, the agent needs to know what actions it can perform and what the effects of those actions are on the environment. And it also needs some, it sort of needs to know what it's meant to be doing, some sort of objective for the agent that to, to be pursuing. And you know, if you go way back to, to, to church, there was this, there was this, um, this idea that we might be able to specify all of this using logical specifications and that it would be automatically synthesized. And we'd have these sort of correct by construction um, programs where we would just modify a very simple specification at a high level and it would be realized at a, at a low level. And in some ways, a programming language that compiles into machine code is, is some sort of approximation of that. But, but that notion of having a correct by construction system is, is really, really a compelling one. Of course, nowadays, when we build systems, when we understand the models of the system, when we understand the transition system, we'll, we'll build a, an MDP or, or some sort of a, a, a transition model and a model of the system and a model of the environment and, and we understand how to build those systems and that's why we can fly safely and, and most of the time, unless the, uh, a door flies off, um, but, but we, can, we, can fly, we can fly, we can drive through the city and, and a lot of things work based upon building sequential decision systems. Um, what I wanna talk about today is, is a particular, um, oh, this is not, whoops, this is, I think I'm just gonna have to use my, this it's oh yeah that's right oh thank you exit full screen and then re-enter excellent suggestion let's see whether that works thank you <laughs> good diagnosis yeah so 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 what what i'm interested in looking at so Sometimes we have models, and when we have models, we should be using them. You know, we, have, we understand physics, we understand all sorts of things about the world, but in a lot of cases with really complex systems, we do not have a model. And in those cases, we will use something like reinforcement learning, which is what the topic of this, this, um, this uh, particular talk is about. And, and in those cases, it's really, and, and, and again, you know, I've said this before, I say this to my students, it's, it's easier to fly a spaceship to the moon than it is to, to, to understand how to walk down the street in some way because there's so much variability and complexity to, to that very simple environment as opposed to, you know, in outer space where we understand the physics and there's no traffic or, or other things to, to compromise us. Anyway, so I'm interested in this talk, I'm gonna talk about sequential decision making in, a, in a, an environment where we don't know the environment and where we don't, where an agent does not know uh, the effects of its actions. 
And I, what I want to argue at the outset, not surprisingly from the, the title of this talk, is the importance of language. And I'm actually just going to read this. So humans have evolved language over tens of thousands of years to provide useful abstractions for understanding and interacting with each other and with the physical world. The claim advanced by some is that language influences what we think, what we perceive, how we focus our attention, and, and what we remember. We use language to uh, capture our understanding of the world around us to communicate high-level goals, intentions, and objectives, and to support coordination with each other. In computer science, we actually use, uh, we study, and in the study of AI in particular, which is my discipline, we use language both to, to represent knowledge representation languages and programming languages to capture our understanding of the world and to convey those to a computer in a hopefully unambiguous uh, form. Uh, importantly, language can provide us with useful and purposeful abstractions that can help us to generalize and transfer knowledge to new situations. So the question that I really wanted to explore with this and, that, and some of the techniques that I'm going to share with you today are, can exploiting the alphabet and structure of language help AI agents learn and reason? And hopefully I'll convince you that it can in, in some ways. So I'm going to ground this for uh, the purposes of this talk in terms of, of a robot, in terms of a very simple example. So imagine that, that at some point in the not too distant future, you uh, buy a robot for your home. Isn't that an exciting thing to think about? And, but, but you know, even similarly to actually having somebody that you might hire to come into your house, you're still going to want to talk to that robot about how, how things work in your, your house, where the bathroom is, down the hallway and down the stairs, by the way, for those who don't know, um, and, and, uh, and how you like things done. And, and so I think that we, it's really important, even for, for AIs that have strong capabilities, a, an important question is how we're going to instruct, task, and impart knowledge to our, our AI. And I think for the most part, seeing where things are going, we will, we will communicate in natural language, or we will expect to be able to communicate in natural language with our AIs. But there are certain cases where we really want to be precise, to be understood precisely, and to, to understand precisely. And in those cases, we may want to use a formal language with all of, the, 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 all of its trappings. So how do we, how do we uh, advise, instruct, task, and impart knowledge to our AI? And how does that AI utilize that knowledge to learn and to act? And this is what I'm going to talk about today. And I'm going to do it in the context of reinforcement learning. Thanks to Shengxi, we, we saw reinforcement learning, of course, is, is a particular way of uh, a particular type of machine learning for sequential decision making, where an agent is actually acting in the environment. It performs an action, but it doesn't know the effect of those actions. It doesn't have a model of, a, of the, its transition system. And then the environment tells it what state it's in. Uh, in a partially observable environment, it's, it's a set of observations. In a fully observable environment, it's, a, it's some approximation of the state, and then the reward it gets. And through trial and error, the agent is going to act over and over and over again to maximize its expected cumulative reward. So how do we, how we actually tell the agent what we want to do is through this very impoverished notion of a reward function, which is a mapping from state to some sort of scalar value, or from state action successor state to some sort of success, scalar value. So you know, for me, I get plus 100 for, for eating ice cream and maybe minus 50 if I stub my toe. But, but none of these agents that we build, regardless of how powerful they are, are, are endowed with a sense of, of, of reward. We have to program, usually some poor graduate student has to laboriously write some Python code to write this reward function for us. And it's, it can be really hard to actually characterize complex behavior. So indeed, two big challenges of, of building reinforcement learning systems in the real world are reward specification. It's hard to define reward functions for complex tasks. And the second thing is sample efficiency. And for anybody who's worked in reinforcement learning, they will know that you know, it takes millions and millions and millions of samples. You know, walking around in the dark, stubbing your toe to figure it for the agent to actually learn how to act in the environment. And so these are some of the things that we're, we wanted to address with the work that I'm going to tell you about today. So returning to this, this sort of model in your head or that we've got this robot and we want to tell this robot some things that, that, that we'd like it to do, I just wanted, I wanted to give you some very simple examples. So we may, there are all sorts of things inform what sort of reward or what the objectives of this agent are. There are goals, there are preferences, there are norms about the world, there are laws. For example, run the dishwasher when it's full or when dishes are needed to, to, uh, for the next meal. 
make sure the bath temperature is between 38 and 43 Celsius immediately before letting someone enter the bathtub. That would be great for a, for a medical assistive robot, for example. Do not vacuum while someone in the house is sleeping. Always serve the person who has been waiting the longest in line. Um, if you're, and this is a good one to know for those who are not Canadian, if you're driving in Quebec, never turn right on a red light. That's a law. You will get a ticket if you get caught. Um, those, are, those are interesting things. And what I wanted to, to um, note with those are, uh, uh, are that they're temporally extended. They are not just, remember our reward function was, was mapping from state to, action, state to a, a scalar or state action successor state to a scalar. But these are, are, are can be arbitrarily complex behaviors that are temporally extended and maybe conflicting with each other. The other thing I want to, to encourage and pause, you, pause right now to do is for you to think about your domains, to think about security, to think about fairness, and to think about the types of properties and objectives that if you're building a sequential decision-making system and concerned about, you might want to actually synthesize. So we've talked a lot about auditing, we've talked a lot about verification, we've ta talked a lot about certification, but if we can embrace this notion of correct by construction, if we can actually build into our system some of these properties that we want it to be able to respect, then we're, we're ahead of the game. And that's sort of what we're trying to do here. And I think one of the messages for you is to think about the types of properties you would want your sequential decision-making systems to, to, to have. And, and then the second me message is that, that these, these behaviors can be complex. One other thing I wanted, two, two other examples I wanted to give you, just to sort of evoke this notion that these are almost like little programming languages in, in, in the way that we can describe these things. So while there are dishes on the table, pick them up and put them in the dishwasher. This is a very nice generalized solution. I don't have to s name every object on the table. I don't have to say pick up cup one and, and fork 30, 335. It's just a, it's a generic way of, of characterizing a, a high level guidance or, or objective to, to be accomplished. So the last thing I wanted to, to, to um, uh, highlight is, is the following instruction, which I'll read for you. When assisting somebody from a car to the sidewalk, please always open the door closest to the person, help the person to standing, move them beyond the car door, close the car door, and then walk them to the sidewalk. And, and you can see this is just sort of, it's a really simple sequence of things that you're, you're going to do, which doesn't seem too, too complex, but, but what's important about it in the context of reward is that doing half of them isn't, shouldn't, shouldn't garner you half the reward. If you help some poor person that needs assistance to get to the hospital, you know, you help them out of their taxi and you get them to standing, and then you leave them, that should not garner you half of the, award, the reward. So often instructions need to be treated in their entirety, and, and reward-worthy behavior requires completion of the entire um, behavior, not just half of it, which, which could be, you know, Quite, quite the contrary, quite, quite harmful. So all that to say, these behaviors that we want to be able to, re to, to, um, to reward are complex. In the case of, of fairness, just to sort of ground this, uh, one can, we've, done, we've done some work lately in fairness. I can't talk about it here because it's, it's sort of embargoed at the, the moment. But, but, but you can think about different protocols that we might use to enforce safety. We, we do things like having people line up in queues to make sure that they're, they're treated in a particular way. Or you can imagine security protocols. I was talking to Joe Near yesterday about security protocols and some ideas for things that, for ways we could do some of this. So thanks to Joe, who's hopefully here. Um, yeah, right there, thank you. So how do we communicate this to our RL agent? And my answer, not surprisingly, is language and in, in the guise of this talk, formal language. So, and my claim is that the alphabet, compositional syntax, and semantics of formal language, uh, not necessarily la formal language, but language, can help RL agents learn, learn what to remember and reason. So again, returning to this notion of, of, of our robot, how do we advise, instruct, task, and impart knowledge to our AI? Again, it, it could be a natural language or in some sort of a formal language. And what I want to talk about today is, is, is one particular formal language, just very briefly, which is linear temporal logic. How many people know lim linear temporal logic? I'm curious. Yeah, not very many, yeah, but a few. Um, so, so linear temporal logic is a, is, is a logical language. It's a propositional modal logic. And what's beautiful, about, and it's a language that has been used for years and years, for decades, um, for verification 
of safety critical systems. It allows and, and for, for of software and hardware systems, and also for specification for automated synthesis. And what's beautiful about this language is it allows you to talk about properties of a trajectory. So you think about your acting over time, and the state is changing over time. I can talk about properties of every state, the orderings of states, or loopy patterns, arbitrarily complex patterns of a trajectory, and I can represent them in a very parsimonious way. So this is a logical language, so it has a set of propositions, things that are true and false in the world, it has all the logical connectives and or not um, an implication, and then it also has these modalities. And the modalities are things like always, which means that something's true in every state of that trajectory, eventually, which means it's eventually going to be true, um, it may not be true before that, and, and various other modalities that we can use as building blocks to really talk about the type of behavior that we want in, in a system. And the important thing is that these, these, these linear temporal logic formulae can be uh, interpreted over a finite trace, a trace with a beginning and an end, or an infinite trace. So, it, so if you think about a controller that is operating in perpetuity, like hopefully whatever's controlling our, the nuclear power plant that's, that's down the street that's going to operate in perpetuity, that we can describe those patterns of behavior in perpetuity. The other thing that's really important is that they can be, interp they can be transformed into automata. And uh, that's an important thing to remember. So just a very simple example, do not vacuum while someone is sleeping, I'll say always, and then I've got a proposition that says vacuuming is true and that sleeping is true and I always not vacuuming and sleeping, they can't occur at the same time, and there's the box notation that you would typically see in this type of a modal logic. So, so that's very nice, sounds like a nice language. How do we actually get that into that R of S or R of S A, S prime? And the answer, at least for this talk, is going to be automata. And I don't know how many of you are, have an undergraduate degree in computer science, and, or even whether you remember the things that you learned in your undergraduate degree in computer science, but I just wanted to remind you for a second of Chomsky's hierarchy. The dude on the, on the right is Noam Chomsky, who you may know either because you know something about formal language or because of his somewhat infamous uh, reputation for his political views. Um, but, but Chomsky defined this hierarchy of language where there were more and more expressive languages all the way up to Turing machines and, the, and their correspondence to automata. And, and so, for example, regular languages or type 3 languages could be represented as finite state automata. Um, as we go up the hierarchy, we get a more expressive language, but then we also need some sort of a data structure like a pushdown automata or a linear bounded automaton or all the way up to a Turing machine to be able to, to capture those things. And of course, natural language fits in there somewhere as well. So we're going to exploit these automata in order to, to, uh, to represent our rewards. So what I'm going to talk to you about for the rest of this, this talk is about a notion of a reward machine and, and how we can exploit it to develop sequential decision-making systems. And I'm hoping that as we're going along, you're thinking about, um, about your own applications and how those could be, how, how those could be um, incorporated. The important thing about that Chomsky hierarchy, I was distracted by seeing my graduate student come walk in the door, um, is, is that any regular language can be represented as a finite state automaton. I told you about linear temporal logic, but think about a regular expression, anything with an if-then-else and while loops, cleany stars and concatenation, any type of very simple programming language can be represented as a regular language, as a, is, is a regular, any regular language, such as those, can be represented as in a finite state automaton. And as we add memory or a stack, um, we can go up the hierarchy and, and, and capture those things. So th here's the rest of the talk in a nutshell, and I'm going to tell you about reward machines. And I'm going to tell you about it in terms of a very simple example. So this is a, a, a simple environment um, where we have four locations. A, B, it's, a, it's a grid world environment in an, and an office environment. So we have four locations, A, B, C, and D. And the task that that little purple agent is going to do is it, it's meant to patrol. So it's going to go from A to B to C to D. And once it's done that full complete patrol loop, it's going to get um, a, a, um, a reward. But, it, but only once it's finished that loop. And there are other things in the environment. There's a co there, are, there are two coffee stations, very important. And there's also a mail room and an office, and those are represented by icons. The little stars are meant to be furniture, something that you don't want to run into because you're going to break it. So here's our little running example. And what, what I typically do to, to, reward, to write a reward function is I'd write a, a piece of code like the one that you see on the right that would say that where I'd keep a little counter to 
remember whether I'd gone to A, B, C, and D, because when you s look at what you observe is what we observe, we only see the, the state of the agent right now. We don't ha see where it's been before. It's not leaving some little red trail of where it's gone, so we have to remember those things. Hence the notion that, that, that these rewards are, are non-Markovian or complex and behavioral in some way, as we saw um, with those examples. So that's what I might typically do, but instead I'm going to write that, that that's very simple program as an automaton and, and as a reward machine. So I'm going to record the reward, encode that reward function in an automaton-like structure using the value, the propositions in the vocabulary that I defined in those, in those icons. And so what is a reward machine? It's an automaton structure for representing uh, a non-Markovian uh, or temporally extended reward function. And it's comprised of a set of states, a uh, finite set of states, an initial state, U0, a set of transitions that are labeled by two things. They're labeled by a condition or a guard. Here I just have one particular proposition. Once it's at A, it's gone to A, it transitions from U0 to U1. But it could be an, uh, an arbitrary propositional formula, you know, and not uh, uh, negation, conjunction. Um, and then uh, associated with that as well is, is a reward function. And that function, so that reward function can either be, a, a, here it's a scalar, and most of the time it's zero until we get to the end, but it can also in and of itself be a, a, a function, a function of the state, the state action successor state as well. So it can be quite complex. This is a very simple example just for you to understand what it is. So I've got my reward function now represented in this automaton structure. What am I going to do with it? And I'll just show you how it operates. So, so there's my little uh, agent in the, the left corner. And, and it starts in U0, and it's moving along, and remember it's going through that cycle where it moves, and, it, and it's told what the state is, and it's told what the reward is. So it's, it, it says, oh, the, I just moved, and the reward machine says, okay, um, you're still in the same state, and you get a reward of zero. Now it moves to A, and it tells the reward machine, and the reward machine okay, says, okay, you transitioned in the reward machine, you're now at U1, and you, you get a reward of one and so on. So one, two, skip a few, 99, 100. Imagine it's gone to A, B, C, D. Now it's here and it, it moves and, and uh, it tells the system it's, it's now gone to D, so it's completed the circuit and it gets a reward of one. Got a reward of one there. So that's how the reward machine works. And, and we can write all sorts of different reward machines. We can deliver, so for example, deliver coffee to the office while avoiding the furniture. So while you, you haven't gotten, the cof gotten coffee yet, you're in U0, but as soon as you get coffee and, and you haven't hit the furniture, which is a little star, you progress to U1. And, and then once you, get the, you go to the office, you, you're t you've finished and you get a reward of one. But if you hit the, the furniture, um, you, you go into this sync state where you, you are perpetually there. And I think this is an important example because, because uh, avoiding the furniture is like a safety constraint. It's a very simple one, but it's a safety constraint that, that where you, you can never get out of it. So it's going to enforce that safety constraint as it's learning how to maximize, it's going to use this information from this reward function to maximize its expected cumulative reward. We can similarly have uh, partial ordering. So deliver coffee to the mail room, the, to the, uh, deliver coffee and mail to the office. So you can either get coffee and then mail and then go to the office, or you can get mail and then coffee and go to the office. So it, it's par it captures these partially ordered um, functions as well. So hopefully what I've done now is convinced you that through, through both my examples of a reward machine, but also this more general notion that these are regular languages and that many, many different Prog uh, programming languages and knowledge representation languages and logical languages can be compiled into an automata, that this reward machine structure is a very compelling and, and uh, expressive way of describing reward-worthy temporally extended behavior. So that addressed, uh, in some ways addressed our first notion of how to represent these very complex um, rewards. But the question is, how are we going to use them in reinforcement learning? So I'm going back to that picture at the beginning, and that's what I'm going to talk to you about now. And, and again, in the interest of time, um, uh, uh, it's, it's a little more, more uh, parsimonious than it might otherwise be, but I'm around if people want to ask me questions. So this whole work is predicated on this very simple idea. And the simple idea is as follows. And I mentioned it previously in some guys. Someone always has to program the reward function. The reward function always has to come from somewhere. It needs to be explicitly articulated in some form. Again, we, we're wired for pleasure and pain. Our AIs are not. And so somebody has to write them down. And if they're written down, 
why don't we share them with our, our uh, learning algorithm so that the learning algorithm can learn much more quickly. You know, it's the same as if I'm trying to, to help somebody and I see that they're lost, if I talk to them and they tell me where they're, where they're going, I can help them much more easily than, than walking around not knowing what they're trying to do. And so it's the, same, it's the same sort of idea. So our simple idea, so rather than have this black box structure, which is the way that it works now, what we're going to do is, is uh, give the agent access to the reward function, and we're going to exploit that reward function structure, that beautiful compositional syntax and semantics that we get from, from, from our formal language and that we actually even get from natural language as well in, or in some guise in order to, to uh, learn much more quickly. So remember this simple idea because everything I'm going to tell you from now on is predicated on that. So, one of the, so the agent's going to exploit the structure in the reward function. I'm going to tell you about a bunch of different algorithms that we developed in order to exploit this idea, and I'm going to show you our, our results on some very simple domains. We've used them on a, a lot of other domains, but I had some nice slides for these domains, so this is what I'm sharing with you. We've tried a bunch of different things. I'm going to highlight just a few of them in the, in the interest of time. So the first thing, which we sort of used as our baseline, but it was something we created our, ourselves, was Q learning over the cross-product MDP and the reward machine. And, and it's referred to some places as just Q-learning, but it's, this, it's Q-learning over this, this, this automaton structure. Because if you just think about it, basically, you think, okay, well, I've, it's just that, that I have this state, which is what I would normally do with Q-learning, which is a type of, of learning, that, simple learning that we use for, for re reinforcement learning. But now I, 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 I want that extra information of where I am within the reward machine. So why don't I just augment the, you know, my, my MDP with a reward function, and, and that will be sufficient. And that's what our baseline was. But what I'm going to show you is that simple idea doesn't work very well. So uh, Q learning over the cross product, which was our baseline. So the, the reason this is important is that a reward machine may define a non-Markovian reward function. So a, 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 a function that does not just uh, depend on the current state, but the depends on the history of what's been uh, happened before, which is what, what we mean by non-Markovian. And just to sort of ground that in an example, imagine that, that my little robot went, went to A, and then it went immediately to that little um, square to the left of D, where you see it right now. If it then moved to D, it would be, so it would be in U1, um, because it had gone to A, but it hadn't gone to the other places. It would be in U1, and it moves to D, and what reward does it get? it gets a reward of zero. But from the, from the, the perspective of, of, of a Markovian reward, all we see is that the, the little triangle moved one spot to the right. If in the, instead, and it gets a reward of zero. So if instead it had gone to A to B to C to D, then it would be in U3 of the reward machine if it performed the exact same action so, so it, and, and ended up in the same state or, it, or did the same state, action, successor states triple by that move. Um, it's going to get a different reward. It's going to now get a reward of one by virtue of having done the patrolling loop and, and, and it completed the reward for worthy behavior. So the reward is non-Markovian. And, and in general form, it depends on the whole history. And so one way we could solve this is by, by depending upon the whole history. And, and so it sort of makes sense that we would, we would, our baseline would just be, well, tell it what the state of the reward machine is and now you can figure out what it is. So that's going to be our first baseline. And I'll show you that that doesn't work as well as one might hope it did. Um, so, and we would just use standard Q-learning, which is a Q-learning, which is a learning technique that we use in reinforcement learning, which is actually guaranteed with sufficient samples to converge to an optimal policy, a policy that maximizes the expected cumulative reward. So the other thing that we, we, t what we thought about using was something called hierarchical reinforcement learning. And for those of you who know about uh, a little bit about reinforcement learning, the idea of hierarchical reinforcement learning is that you're going to build a set of sort of macro actions, something they call options. And you can build these like little building blocks of, of, of skills that you can perform. So I know how to flip. Um, I know how to flip pancakes, or my robot knows how to get from, from here to navigate up the stairs to get, get, to get out in a particular way. So you can imagine if you wanted to build, and, many, and hierarchical reinforcement learning is really great. You can build these little skills, and they're little building blocks, and then you put the building blocks all together, and it makes it much, more easy to, much easier to construct behavior. And so we thought, hey, why don't we try to see whether we can augment hierarchical reinforcement learning with a reward machine. And so we have two um, particular techniques that, that use that, one that just hierarchical reinforcement learning, and one that actually, so in hierarchical reinforcement learning, there's this meta controller that decides what, which option, which sort of macro action to use. 
and, and here we help, the reward machine tells you what to do. You know, in, in A, you're meant to use the policy for A, and in B, you're meant to use the policy for B, so, so we're, we would do it that way. So that was what we did in, in, in hierarchical reinforcement learning with reward machines. The, the thing I'm going to tell you about the most is QRM, which is uh, Q learning with reward machines. Uh, we, and, and, and I'll tell you a little bit about that now. So this was the algorithm that really was, was defining for us. So, and here's the idea. Uh, we learn one policy or Q value for each state of the reward machine. So when we're at, uh, U Z so we learn, uh, um, at when we're at U0, we learn a policy Q0, a, a, a policy for Q1, a policy for Q2, and another policy for Q3. We select actions using the policy of the current reward machine state, but then, and this is the secret sauce, uh, so when we're at, we're, when we're at uh, U0, we uh, use the policy, um, we select actions and use the policy for Q0. When we're at U1, we, use, we select and use the actions for, for with using Q1, and so on. Um, but then the secret sauce is that we reuse that experience, that state action successor state triple, that little experience that we had, we use it counterfactually to imagine that we were in some other state of the reward machine. And so we're actually counterfactually imagining we were somewhere else, and then we ask the reward machine, if we'd been in, your, in, in U2, what experience would we have gotten? If we were in U, or what reward would we have gotten? If we're in U3, what reward would we have gotten? And in doing so, we're able to update our Q, these Q functions, Q0, Q1, Q2, Q3, simultaneously. So even though we were in one particular state, we can counterfactually update all these different Q functions within our policy, and so we get a huge amount of bang for our buck. And it seems counterintuitively in some way, but, but all we're really doing, we've just got this state action successor state triple, and we're just trying it on in these different settings. And so that is the, the secret sauce that, that, that will show, you, that will explain why the behavior that I'm going to show you works so well. Um, so we're going to select an action according to the reward machine state, just to ground that, update each Q value, um, as, as if the reward machine were in that corresponding state. And so when we're in U0, we're going to update Q0. And again, we stay in Q0. This is, this is the Q function update algorithm. When we're in, in, in U1, uh, if we're going to update Q1, we stay there um, when we do that move. And then similarly, um, let me just skip to the, this is the interesting one. When we're in U3, um, and we do that same move, that same move to the, the D spot, um, we actually transition in the reward machine. So the, the update that we see here, the, uh, Q, the Q value of a state and an action is one, the reward that we get um, from, from that action, the immediate reward we get, plus the discounted uh, future return that we're going to get wherever we end up. And, and where we end up here is in, is in Q0. So there are, sorry, I'm going through it fairly quickly, and I apologize. I know not everybody knows about re uh, reinforcement learning. For those who do, they'll recognize these equations very quickly. And for those who don't, just I, where we define these equations by virtue of the transition system, and, and, and it, it all works very, very simply. It's actually a fairly straightforward um, computation to be performing. But the idea is that we're doing this counterfactual reasoning, which is what gives us this, this good performance that we're going to see. And notice that we're in Q0 there, because that's where our future reward is going to be coming from, from that point. So we also did something called reward shaping. So one of the problems with reinforcement learning is that, that most of the environment is sparse. You know, I'm walking around here and I'm not getting any reward. Um, it's only when I go and, I don't know, pick up my cup and, and drink some water, which I'm going to do, I'm going to get a reward for this. But most of the time what I'm doing is, is not garnering any reward. And, and so what people in, in reinforcement learning have this idea that, that, you know, sort of like Hansel and Gretel, they're going to take the reward that we get from the things that are reward worthy and sort of sprinkle the reward back um, like sprinkling a bit of the cookie to sort of incentivize you to guide you towards reward-worthy behavior. And that's something called reward shipping. It's actually very beautiful. You can cr define these potential functions and transform the reward, the, reward the reward function into one where there's reward in a lot of other places within the state. But the, the, the transformation using these potential functions is guaranteed to preserve the optimality of, of, the, the, sol the, of the, the solution that you're, you're going to get from, from a... a 
from Q learning or from some other um, from some other type of learning algorithm. So it's it's actually really beautiful, and we did some work with that, which I'm not going to tell you about. And then we also um, did one other thing, which is that we created a variant of that QRM, that counterfactual learning algorithm, called CRM. And I'll just mention that for a minute. So so. I've been showing you this work in terms of a very simple example um, of an office world environment, but we've actually um, done this, of course, in much more interesting domains, and in particular in deep learning domains where we have function approximation. And in those domains, we originally had a QRM algorithm, but it was always hard to sort of embed it in these different types of, of deep learning algorithms because we had this reward machine states and these other states. And so what we did instead was, and, and we were con constructing multiple Q functions, one for each state of the reward machine. So rather than do that, we created a variant which intuitively is the same and actually has the same behavior in, in, uh, um, in tabular environments, where what we actually did was we, we embodied you know, so rather than having a Q function that's a function of the state and the actions, and we have one Q function per reward machine state, instead what we do is we embed the reward machine state into a, a sort of what you can think of as a tuple that defines the state. So it's the state and the, 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 the um, reward machine state. It's sort of the cross product. And then we can synthesize, again, the same notion of counterfactual experiences, but it, this, this formulation is just much easier to embed into an arbitrary deep learning algorithm because now there is one state which is comprised of this tuple. And so we have the same notion of counterfactual experiences, and they behave exactly the same um, in tabular domains, um, but, but obviously a little, um, this is much easier to embed in, in, a, in a deep learning. So the one thing I wanted to say, and one other beautiful thing about this work, particularly in, in relation to hierarchical reinforcement learning, which I also really love, um, so not to slag hierarchical reinforcement learning, but, but these, these, this work, the QRM algorithm and the, and the CRM algorithm, are guaranteed to preserve the optimality of, of, our, our of, of any sort of Q learning or reward shaping algorithm that, that exists. Um, and and um, so that's really nice. And we'll see that in experiments. So I'm going to move on a little bit more quickly because I, I saw Nicola looking at the time, and I and I know that uh, uh, we have coffee is waiting. Um, so just a few quick experiments. So um, in uh, um, so so we 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 did some experiments in discrete sort of tabular domains, and where where of course lots of these these algorithms. Um, preserved optimality, and some of them used decomposition, and then we also did it in some, some uh, uh, continuous domains. So in the, in the simple office world environment, um, we have some results, um, and what I want to show you is on the, on the x-axis, whoops, whoops, sorry, yeah. So on the x-axis, I have the number of training steps. On the y-axis, I have the normalized discounted reward, which means that one is perfect. And I'm going to show you behavior for four algorithms here. Q learning over that cross product, the thing that I said seemed like it should be sufficient and a good idea. Um, hierarchical reinforcement learning, hierarchical reinforcement learning with reward machines, and then that QRM algorithm, that counterfactual algorithm. And the important thing that you want to see here is, is, is sample efficiency. How quickly, so what we can see is that in this environment, our, our, our Q, QRM algorithm converges to the optimal policy very quickly um, and with very few samples relative to even the, the algorithm that, that, um, that works with the cross product that knows about the reward machine state, but it's not using that counterfactual reasoning. And that makes sense because it's not getting as much bang for each experience buck. And, but remember that somewhere over here, uh, so I don't know where it is, um, it's going to converge to the optimal. So given enough, s it's guaranteed to converge to the optimal given enough samples, but it, so it really just shows it's, it's, it's on its journey and it will eventually get to one, but it needs a lot more samples. Uh, hierarchical reinforcement learning with the reward machine and without a reward machine. What this really highlights is, is, is the problem with the myopic nature of, a, of, a, of hierarchical reinforcement learning which is that it, it uses these little building blocks, but it just assembles the building blocks without looking ahead to what it's going to do in the future. And so sometimes it makes an, a myopically optimal choice, which then forces it to make a poor choice going forward. It doesn't use the look ahead that our systems use. And so just to sort of ground that, if you're going if, in this example where you have to get coffee and then go to the office, um, the optimal solution is to go to the further coffee machine because the office is very close. And you and I would probably make that choice. But what the myopic re hierarchical reinforcement learning system does 
is it goes to the closer coffee machine because it's making that myopic choice of how to optimally get to the coffee, but then that forces it to take a very long route to get to the office. And you'll see this manifest in the experiments with, with hierarchical reinforcement learning, that by making that myopic choice, it's, it limits its ability to get an optimal, it, it's not guaranteed to convert to an optimal policy, and it, and it um, does poorly. This was a craft world domain, same X and Y axis, I think, again, showing that our QRM algorithm is doing well. And again, I, I don't know whether you can see this, but there's a blue line. Even 10 to the sixth training examples, Q learning, the Q learning that uses the reward machine state is still flatlined. But again, it will eventually, with enough samples, converge to the optimal policy, but these were harder problems, and so it couldn't actually do it in any reasonable period of time. We did work in continuous state again, um, with this is a water world domain, it's like a billiards domain, so, so we're, we're controlling the little white ball, these balls are bouncing around, and, and we had things like never hit a yellow ball or hit a red ball and then two blue balls, and it was we were controlling the agent to, to make it do those sorts of things. We integrated our work with, with what, what at the time was, was a state of the art, double DQN, and, and, uh, and again, ours is, is the red, which shows uh, much better performance than, than not using our counterfactual reasoning. Again, uh, in, with, with CRM in Majoko, this physics-based simulation domain, uh, our, our CRM algorithm is the orange one, and we can see that it's doing better than uh, uh, same, same notion of X and Y axes, um, well, almost average rewards per step, um, and again, set number of training steps on, on the, the X axis. Again, what we can see is that our CRM does better on this particular half-cheetah task, but interestingly, um, uh, the hierarchical reinforcement learning does better on this second task. And we wanted to show this because there's still work to do on this. Um, and it's interesting. It shows the benefit of hierarchical reinforcement learning when, when you know, it works out. So this task, the, the, the cheetah had to go back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. So it needed to sort of anticipate when it was going to have to stop and turn around to go back and forth. Whereas the, the task on the right was just go to A, then to B, then to C, then to D. So the myopic solution was always going to be an optimal solution. And so we see that when, when that, that, that myopic um, uh, choice uh, confounds you, it doesn't, hierarchical reinforcement learning doesn't do as well. We, hierarchical reinforcement learning with reward machines doesn't do as well, but, but when we actually have, uh, when that doesn't bite us, we actually do very well with, with hierarchical reinforcement learning with reward machines. So, uh, one last thing and then I'm going to, to, to wrap up and, 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 and answer questions. So, this is all very nice, but, but you look at these automata and you imagine a complex system and you think, how am I going to actually create these automata? And I'm going to leave most of this for discussion afterwards, but just let me say that to, to remind you that we, can, we, we don't have to write the automata. We don't have to necessarily specify the, the automata. I mean, some people may like to. I, I'm pretty good at doing, doing that. But, but again, we want, we want people to be able to speak to their, their AIs, don't have to write down little automata for them. So we can specify them. And we can, you know, leveraging this notion of formal and natural languages and the correspondences to automata, we can actually write or specify in any sort of formal or or natural language, and then def and then compile them into a, a deterministic finite state automata, and then into a reward machine, and use this reward machine as a sort of normal form structure for representing something that's been uh, specified in any other type of language. And the beauty of doing that is that then we don't we've got these algorithms that leverage reward machines. We don't have to write one that leverages LTL and one that leverages regular expressions and one that leverages whatever your favorite programming or natural language is. We've got a sort of normal form representation. And indeed, we've we actually we've done a lot of work with linear temporal logic as well as doing this as Dahomeda work. But, but I think this is a really important point about this, that you can use it with a, an arbitrary number of languages. We've used a high-level controller to sort of construct a sketch, if you will, and, and, and deordered it to create reward machines that way. So, and, and that's been a very compelling thing. It, it's, it may be very easy for you or for a language model to be able to say, oh, walk over and, and pick up the cup and then, and then walk to the side of the podium. But, but for to, and, and that might be easy to specify in language. But what's hard and where we still need reinforcement learning is understanding the pressure that this end, these, this end effector puts on my cup when it's got a certain amount of water in it. So, so we need the, the trial and error, that trial and error feedback to understand how to build a controller at another level. But we can, we can generate some of these things automatically at a high level. And then we can also, and I'm not going to talk about it here, I can talk about it offline, we've also done a lot of work 
in learning reward machines from data. And you can imagine different ways in which you might, in which you might do it. Both to use it in fully observable environments for it to create this structure from, from experience, but also in partially observable environments to serve as a memory. And I'll talk about that offline because I really want to get to the end of my talk. Um, uh, and, and again, this doing this, learning these reward machines, and then using uh, our, our algorithms uh, really does result in, 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 in the, this great behavior that you see here. Again, this is learning reward machines plus our deep learning it are these, these behaviors that you see up here at the top where, where the 200 is optimal in these examples. So just to recap, what did I tell you? I was interested in, I, again, couched in this notion that we want to be able to, to create sequential decision-making systems. And in addition to auditing, in addition to certifying, in addition to testing their behavior, we may want to be able to tell them in advance what we want to do and optimize for that. Rules and, and preferences and, and complex behaviors, um, uh, social norms and various other things that we can represent using these languages. And, and, and have the, the, the reinforcement learning system actually leverage them. The two problems we talked about were reward specification and sample efficiency, and hopefully I've convinced you that the alphabet and compositional syntax and semantics of formal languages uh, can help reinforcement lear learning agents learn, learn what to remember, and reason. And that formal language really, or language, formal language, uh, is a powerful and effective tool to advise, instruct, and task, and impart knowledge to our AIs. So big idea was that we create this reward machine, we expose it to the, uh, and we expose it, oops. We create, the key insight was that we were gonna reveal the reward function to the agent. And, and it works very well, as I showed you. We've got all sorts of code, we've got all sorts of papers. I'm gonna click through these very quickly because then it'll be recorded. Um, and we've done this in deterministic domains and we've done it with LTL. And the last, very last thing I wanted to say was that there are all sorts of other uh, applications of formal languages, and we've seen some of them here, and I think those of you who raised your hands in it who know about formal languages knows about that, know about this. I was talking about synthesis, synthesizing um, a behavior, synthesizing a sequential decision-making system, a policy um, that, that, that adheres to or that optimizes for these properties, these complex properties. We can also do verification. We can also do monitoring using these, and, and we've done work on monitoring a system by watching, you know, specifying these complex behaviors that we want to make sure that the, the system is adhering to and monitoring them as the system is going along, or post hoc auditing um, offline traces or trails of, of, of past behavior that we're looking at offline to audit for particular behavior. And so hopefully some of what I've told you about this language and some of what I told you about the computational work will inspire you um, to, to use this for some of the types of problems that, that you're looking at. And I'd be happy to talk to people afterwards or, or offline about, about, about the application of some of these ideas to, to other applications. So thank you very much for listening, and, and I'm done. Thanks.